I'm Claudia. I'm the editor of Able Zine. I'm currently in, my, well, my pronouns are she, her, um, and I'm in my bedroom with a orange wall behind me, um, lots of paraphernalia and artwork and photographs and things in the background. I am um, an olive skinned woman with short, dark hair. Um, I'm wearing a black leotard with a blue um, stretchy kind of top thing over it. And I'm wearing a necklace, um, lots of jewelry with crystals and silver. So I'll begin by introducing Yo-Yo. Yo-Yo Lin is a Taiwanese-American interdisciplinary media artist who explores the possibilities for self-knowledge in the context of emerging embodied technologies. She often uses video, animation, live performance, and lush sound design to create meditative memory scapes. Her recent bodies of work reveal and revalue the complex realities of living with chronic illness. Her practice often facilitates sites for community-centered abundance, developing into physical and virtual media installations, workshops, and accessible nightlife parties. Yo-Yo has shown her work at South by Southwest, New York Film Festival, and the Allied Media Conference. Yo-Yo is the co-founder of Rotations, a collaborative movement practice, working towards deepening our understanding of artistry, disability, and access. Um, I just realized I forgot to do my own image description, but I'll do it after everyone else. So Yo-Yo, if you could please introduce yourself, your pronouns, and give us an image description. Yeah, hi, I'm Yo-Yo. Uh, I go by she and her pronouns, and I'm wearing this really cozy white hoodie right now. I'm Taiwanese American. Um, I have this like kind of like bleached hair with like fading gray blue dye and I'm currently calling in from my bedroom which has a brown door and like a white wall and like these cabinets um from Taiwan actually so yeah glad to be here great uh, now I'll introduce Hannah Hannah Nishat Botero is a Colombian Pakistani visual artist writer and designer her inter her interdisciplinary practice is influenced by personal experiences as a type one diabetic, as well as by cultural theory. Hannah combines text, illustration and photographic images in her work to explore illness, disability and the body mind. Hannah recently moved from New York City to Barcelona where she is currently completing an MA in editorial design. Hi, so I'm Hannah. Um, my pronouns are she, her as well. And uh, I'm currently in my living room in Barcelona, like just against a white wall. I um, have short brown hair and a fringe, round glasses. I'm just wearing a blue vest and a white t-shirt. Um, yeah. So Aminda Verdi is a British South Asian artist, writer, activist, and community organizer. As a disabled, chronically ill, neurodivergent, brown woman from poverty, Aminda's artistic practice is navigated through an intersectional, auto-ethnographic lens. Her practice is often research and life-led, inherently subverting and transforming spaces into political sites of radical agency. This traverses multiple disciplines, such as social justice, technology, physical computing, crypt technoscience, physics, biology, and philosophy. Aminda also works across multiple art forms as a world remaking and dismantling tool and this endlessly adapting to a world built without intersectional disability in mind. Her art forms include digital and generative art, kinetic sculpture, installation, moving image, sound art, live art and performance. So please uh, unmute and introduce yourself. I'm Aminda, my pronouns are she and her. Um, my image description is I'm a brown woman with long black curly hair, uh, three facial piercings, and I'm wearing a red jumper. Next up is Jo. jo Joseph Wilk is a London-born artist exploring automotive forms of expression that utilise new interfaces for alternative bodies. His experience of disability, living with pain, physical limitations, disillusionment and disconnection, strongly impacts his practice. Performance is a key part of his practice as it fulfills a need to be seen physically and creatively, but in a form he controls. 
He deconstructs, misuses, and repurposes software to challenge notions of ownership, narrative, and visibility. Hi, yeah, so I'm Joseph, or just Joe's fine. Um, I'm a 40-year-old white male, messy hair, short hair, unshaven, uh, bags under my eyes, and uh, quite a colorful shirt on. I'm quite tired. <laughs> <laughs> Great, and... Um... Oh, sorry, pronouns are uh, he, he, him as well. Great. Okay. So I can't wait to get um, stuck in. I think, um, so let's start with you. So I originally became obsessed with your work due to your explorations of the disability icon, which is globally recognized as a wheelchair symbol. Your ongoing project, Symbols of Disability, isn't just vis vi visually provocative, but conceptually underpinned by the titles and captions you use to describe them. Um, I wanted to ask, can you explain what you hope to achieve with this project and how automation helped you do it? But I will um, go to my slideshow now and show the others some examples of this. Um, so I just wanted to show these and read out um, the captions or the titles that Joe gives them. This one says, restricted and constricted growth. Constrictive design creates disability that limits growth and engagement in society. Disability as a social construct, scaffolding as material. The layering of microaggressions of access. Societies that create disability, invisible obstacles and design that hide in our cities, enforcing barriers. If we do not see it, there is no thought to change it. The effort of having to ask for access. The strength and toughness of disability modeled on the growth of spiders webs. Stairs and drops, designs that create disability, and body and wheelchair. So take it away, Joe. Please tell us about this project. Sure. Um, so, so I guess I have have a few reasons for doing this project. Um, one of them, I represents my relationship with the disability icon, which is quite a complex relationship. Um, I think um, when I first started using a wheelchair, yeah, um, I've used a wheelchair for the last 20 years or so of my life, um, I kind of took uh, strength from this symbol, as in I was very nervous to go out in public spaces and having the symbol meant that um, there was somewhere I could go and some, I felt like I was uh, accounted for and had some sort of reassurance. And I guess over time, um, this kind of promise uh, started to be breached or broken in some way to me. And I started to see the seams in the way that society um, represents and facilitates disability. Um, times where uh, there is a symbol there, but it's like hidden or like somebody's not there at the desk or you can't get the train because you haven't booked 24 hours in advance. And all these kind of problems started to make me realize that this symbol um, I have a lot of almost uh, conflict with, and it's that conflict of, uh, of mistrust with society and this promise that in some ways is broken to me about where I fit and how I'm um, able to participate in society. So I think I was really hoping with this to explore what that conflict meant to me, why that conflict existed, um, what my symbol for disability would be. I have, as like I said, I have this personal a set of discomfort with the symbol and it comes from that societal friction and I wanted to see if I could create my own symbol or explore that symbol in different ways to discover what disability meant to me what um, it said about society and framing it as artwork to also kind of do a form of design activism really to not just ask myself questions but also ask questions wider society and specifically that these pieces go in galleries um, and uh, hence provo provoke questions around some of the negative um, associations that are made with the sedentary kind of static wheelchair icon as opposed to a more active fluid icon such as one suggested by the Accessible Icons Project. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess, guess finally, this project was also done just as kind of COVID started to hit. Um, and I was doing a lot of homeschooling with my daughter and um, my mental health was not good and kind of, Part of this project was uh, self-help for myself slightly, as in um, when, when I couldn't work and I had to rest and I was in pain or was unable to function, um, I would have this autom automated pen drawing machine that I used in this project whirring in the background. So I'm kind of 
lying in beds, not feeling great, but just hearing that my work is continuing, it kind of really became a part of a part of kind of a therapy almost to me slightly of this this feeling that even though I was not able to participate or not able to fully engage, I was still part of me was continuing the process of creating these pieces and something to look forward to as well once the machine was finished. So yeah. I think they're um, so empowering, um, not just the images themselves, but the process behind it. And um, this leads me to my next question, which is that your website states that you share your source code. Um, so you use coding and then the, the pen plotter machine will probably spend hours creating these different um, icons on your behalf. Um, so why is it important to you to share your source, source code with the world? And so I think um, I, have, I have quite a, a kind of a tight personal relationship with code. I very much um, during the process of um, learning to live with a disability, um, I kind of took uh, how I describe it. So I took kind of code as um, the thing that I would keep doing and the thing that no matter what I would push through and try and do. And um, it causes me a lot of physical pain to write code. A lot of time I can't use a computer. Um, so this kind of process of um, when I can't use a computer, I can think about code, I can think about ideas. And when I get the chance to write code, it's a very special moment for me. It's, it's, a, it's a privilege. It feels really... I kind of describe it like, um, you know, going flying down a hill as fast as you can, the wind rushing in your face, that sense of freedom and empowerment um, is, uh, has become very important to me as, as an individual. And I feel like um, it is important to, sh to share, to share that code. Um, it is very important to me. So I feel like it's important for it to be visible as, as a piece of art in itself, as code, as a medium. That code says a lot about me and my practice. I think there's also the idea that there's um, a lot, a lot of um, thoughts around the idea that software and computers are kind of representative ideologies. They're layers of abstraction, and often um, computers uh, and software are very much presented in a way that they have to be used in a certain way. They, they're own, you're only allowed to do this with them, and all these layers of software on top of each other, all these compli complicated parts of the machine, you have very little control over. And I think apart from me of sharing that source code is, I don't think it does it completely, but it's my attempt to try and remove the mystique behind computing and computer software to someone could see this piece in a gallery and they could be like, wow, that, I really like that, or I hated it. And then they can go and look at the source code and be like, oh, so that's, that's how it's done. I can, right, I thought this was some sort of like magical process, but no, I can see what's happening here. And that kind of revealing and removing any magic and really presenting it as, a, as an, as accessible piece of, of a tool, I think is um, kind of an important way in redefining who can have a relationship with software. And often the fact that a lot of our design preconceptions are present in software. And a lot of those problems about access are also present in software. So it brings interesting questions about how we can, if, if we break down the computer and the interface and go back to things like code, how can we reimagine how we might interact with the computer? How do we want to do that? And what do we want to say? Great. And then next, I wanted to talk and discuss the side of you that identifies as a performance artist and bring attention to one of your performance events titled How to Be Seen, um, which was described as a streamed live coding performance. Uh, can you tell us about this project? I'd like to know whether as a disabled artist, you felt that trad traditional exhibition spaces are inaccessible and how technology can help us overcome these barriers. Yeah, um, so this, this was um, 2009 in New York and uh, I was based in London, UK at the time. Um, it was a very difficult project because um, I'd, I'd spent um, 12 weeks uh, studying remotely at the School for Poetic Computation in New York. Um, I was supposed to go there but um life and um uh medical issues just meant it was it was not possible for me so i participated remotely um and it's uh this kind of piece was almost uh, a frustrated piece because um i 
highly value this chance to be present remotely and uh, kind of learning remotely in a school, but it also is a lot of limitations. Um, a lot of, um, you know, being left, left on the shelf, literally happening, being left on the shelf and everybody leaves the room and you're kind of like stuck in your laptop, just kind of looking. And I, I, with this piece, I kind of wanted to deal with the performance aspect of the fact that I do a lot of, my early work was about controlling my visibility through performance and controlling my image. Um, and I wanted to use these tools of like frustration to me, these cameras and these screens, that was the only way for me to ever be in this space. To try and explore bringing myself out in out into the gallery space, um, which ultimately would always be destined to fail. But it's kind of that frustration and that attempt to be present and feel like I'm there when I am a blank screen. And the way that people interact with screens is very different. The way that uh, people respond to you is very different. Um, so this is kind of uh, the, the setup of the piece was two images of myself, um, one on an iPad and one on a monitor. And I'm kind of live coding, writing code on the spot to change my image, um, giving it depth, uh, effectively playing around with depth and dimension to what is a flat image on a flat screen, trying to like bring it out into that space. And one of the really nice aspects about it um, that, I, that I liked the most was that people could kind of go walk about with the iPad with me on it for the webcam. And uh, a lot of people kind of gave me impromptu tours of a venue I had studied at for like three months and actually had never really seen. And it was the first time I gained a sense of the space that I was in. Um, it seems weird because obviously the camera in a lesson is very like set up. So the idea that you can move around the space and see like the cupboard under the stairs and all, all these um, little nuances um, was, was really nice. Um, it's kind of came close to giving me that sense of being present, um, which was, was, was what I wanted. Um, and I felt like it was a really nice chance to engage, engage with people and bring about this discussion about, um, about my presence being virtual and what, ex what effect that has. Um, it kind of le leads to the, to, the, to the gallery question. Um, it's a really complicated one. Um, so I've, I've done this performance in various galleries. My, my pre-constraint for ever doing this in any gallery is that gallery must be accessible. It must have wheelchair access because I think it's, um, I find technology very empowering and very exciting, but technology is not kind of a band-aid for the problems of like societal design. And I would not want in any way for someone to say, we have this unaccessible venue, but we can bring you to it using, you know, like VR or like a headset or like a screen. I'm like, that, that's really exciting, but should we first address the issue of, can I go to your venue? Who can go to your venue? Who can participate in this work? And like, wh what are you doing to enable them? And if, if those things are possible, then I feel like it does enable me to, especially in a, in a COVID period, travel and do these things in, in locations. Um, but I'm also very aware that as I said, this project was a frustrated project. It was intended to be frustrated. It was, it was acknowledging the flaws of virtual interfaces. And I personally uh, find while it's great to be able to participate in things like these galleries and these exhibitions, um, it's not the same as being there. And I think that's, that, that to me is quite important to distinguish as in they're good, but um, the value of being there to me is, is, is it's important not to pretend that being there virtually somehow removes the value of being there physically. Being there physically, experiencing the space, like I said, seeing the walls, seeing the corners, seeing someone like smirk at something or laugh at something, those um, very human ways of interacting with people in a gallery space are extremely important to me. Yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah, I mean, there's loads that I'd like to say about it, but um, I think we'll carry on with individual questions and then we'll come together and have more of a fluid, uh, free flowing conversation amongst all of us. So thank you for that. I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment and move on to Yo-Yo, I think. So one of the things I really like about a lot of your projects um, such as Cath New, Blue Tears and even your recent collaborative project with uh, the Shed NYC is the way in which you use technology to recreate elements of the natural world. 
there's often criticism around technology that it detracts and removes us from nature. And in your work, it is quite the opposite. In this sense, I think your work has a strong therapeutic element, which I think is beautiful and essential because we are deprived of therapeutic experiences in inner cities. Um, can you give us some examples of how you have used technology in the past to simulate nature and its cycles and what your reasoning or purpose was for this? And I will share once again um, some images. This is Yo-Yo. I just wanted to say, Joseph, your work is amazing. I'm just, yeah, really excited to keep talking to you more about it. Um, Thank you. Here we go. Oh, yeah. yeah. OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this project is um, about the bioluminescent phenomenon that happens in the oceans in this series of islands near China um, called Matsu. And originally this was a film-based installation. Um, the film was uh, footage that we got on the islands and there was going to be a venue space uh, as part of the ecological center there. Um, a lot of my work kind of sits at the bridge between, um, yeah, like media installation work and also uh, commercial work as well. So this was actually a commission that was done for the Ecological Center. Um, and I often think, yeah, when you're working with technology, that often becomes the case where, you know, you're required to have these kind of partnerships for these kinds of larger installations to happen. Um, but yeah, specifically talking more conceptually about this piece, you know, I think a lot of what I was trying to explore was, yeah, like understanding that there are experiences within nature and within technology that intersect and finding ways in which technology could be used to, yeah, like bring into, bring people into spaces that they never would have had access to before. Um, so I always think it's really fascinating when people think about things like in this binary of like nature versus technology, when in reality, there's like a lot of technology that is designed and created using structures based in nature as well. Um, and sometimes I also think nature is like the most complex technology itself. And yeah, like a lot of the work that I do is based in video and animation. So I've been really thinking about how slow nature really is and, you know, how like an entire human lifetime can be a blink in the lifetime of a forest. So I've been figuring out ways to pay respect and honor the slowness within video making and creating more ambient and meditative works. And I often use projection to allow the digital work to live in temporary physical spaces. And I'm also very interested in natural cycles, you know, like this piece was about the cycles of the moon and pain cycles and the phases of the moon and the phases of reopening for New York City. Um, so thinking through about how, yeah, like there are these kind of like bureaucratic structures that exist, especially within this time frame of pandemic where, yeah, like time is losing meaning, but also time is also essential in reopening up the city to some sense of normalcy, quote, quote. Um, so I think what ends up happening with that is that there is this tension that exists between the bureaucratic and the natural cycles. And this piece was about that, where the center video was a piece created by Ezra and Noah Bennis, who go by the name, the brother Stick. And with poetry and audio description by Danilo Machado. 
and on the edges of this piece are actually um, four different natural um, directions or elements of how, yeah, like crypt disabled bodies exist and navigate their lives. So the top left corner is a bed and on it will flash a symbol, uh, the Chinese symbol for ground. And so that was kind of like the element of the earth. And on the top right corner is a phase of the moon. So as the moon phase is changed, this web-based video would also change. So um, we had the piece kind of exist over an entire month of moon phases. And then, yeah, so like the bottom right is this figure that kind of like bursts out with these kind of tendrils and it's, they're all animated loops. And a lot of what I love about creating animations is there is this opportunity to create, you know, non-linear works and create works that are cyclical. So for me, you know, growing up Buddhist and growing up in a Taoist household, there was this sense of cyclicalness and cycling that existed within, you know, beliefs of like reincarnation and beliefs of karma and various ideas of continuity. So thinking about how that also applies to pain cycles, like on the bottom left corner, that was a symbol that radiated out and pulsed at a certain speed that signified a certain level of pain. So yeah, just thinking through kind of like this, yeah, this like sense of no beginning or end, but just is, I think is like very much a big part of how I've been, yeah, like thinking through crypt time and nature time, yeah. There's um, a few things that are coming to mind because um, the resilience journal uh, that we'll see shortly is also cyclical. And so that is actually a lot of mirroring between the different projects. But uh, before we move on, I wanted to mention that uh, I really wanted to attend, but this uh, residency or kind of um, the thing that you were doing with the shed with phases and in between, you had a full moon party as well, like a accessible nightlife event like you, you do with some of your other projects as well. So can you tell us a little bit about why it's important to you or you know what it what were the reasonings behind beginning accessible nightlife projects using virtual technology? Yeah, totally. Well the idea came along with Kevin Gotkin who has been doing like a lot of um, disability nightlife organizing in New York City and when the pandemic hit, there was just like a lot of, um, yeah, just like a lot of pain and a lot of like anger around this sudden transfer of everyone being in virtual space and this very real um, example of how when, you know, disabled folks ask for a certain type of access like remote telecommunication it's like seen as impossible, but like when the dominant public asks for it, then it's like suddenly available. So I think there was like a lot of hurt in that moment and a lot of, you know, reconciling of like, you know, like what are the ways in which we've already been doing this and what are the ways in which we've already been using virtual spaces and digital technology to find each other. Um, and so we began this series of virtual parties on Zoom and at first it was like super simple. We would just like have Kevin DJ and I would do some VJing, like video jockeying, just like screen sharing and sharing videos. And then it would like became a vibe and we were like, this is so cool. So then we just like kept doing them. And then the full moon party was like 
an extension of that, but specifically about the moon. Um, so the, there was like music about the moon, there was like a moon poet or a, like a poet, like a poem about the moon. Um, yeah, so yeah, that was, that was that party, yeah, yeah. Let's see, so um, your project, The Walls of My Room Are Curved, is an invocation to listen deeply to the body, to crip the cyborg figure by using several microphones attached to your body as you dance, capturing the live sounds of creaking and crackling bones and joints as they shift, extend, and rotate. Your other project, Resilience Journal, uses soft data to track dimensions of illness and how it affects us in everyday life. This data, most commonly stored in circular graphs in your journal, have been transformed into hard data to be realized in 3D and give form to your experience. These projects use your own disabled body as a material, the internal and the external. It reminds me of the phrase you have on your Instagram bio, embodied technologies. So I wanted to ask you, what is embodiment to you and how do you find technology can assist you in this practice? Yeah, totally. I feel like embodiment is one of the hardest things for me to accomplish or find. Um, yeah, I think I kind of set this out to be a way for me to find myself thinking through living with illness and thinking through, yeah, for the very first time, kind of just like all the different layers of trauma that exist within it. Um, so it really started from this project, the Resilience Journal, which was very much a personal journal for me that was looking at the different ways that my illness presented itself in daily life. So you know, on the left, there are notes from every day. This was from February, 2019. And on the right, there's a circular visualization with seven different dimensions. Um, the outside layer is felt it, which is the chronic pain. And you'll see at the bottom, there's like a bar that goes from five to zero and how dark that coloring is represents how intense that experience was so a lot of what I was exploring was kind of like thinking through how to visualize yeah all the soft fuzzy abstract data that existed with my illness um as opposed to like all the hard data that exists with my illness which comes from a lot of the medical um paperwork and tests and interventions that happen so yeah, you know, tracking chronic pain, tracking logistical issues that pro that crop up on the daily, usually resulting from like me asking for help from someone. Um, body image, just like the way that a lot of what I experience to me is very visible. Like I feel like my disability is quite visible, but for others, it's very not. So just like navigating what that is like um social pressures just like yeah I think that goes kind of without explaining um going to the doctor and future is about uh tracking the different ways that I'm enacting my preferred future narrative in the present and past is just like different ways that past traumas and past memories kind of crop up um so yeah like Navigating that was very much a process of thinking through what my illness was in a way that was on my own terms. Like I think it echoes kind of what Joseph was talking about in terms of like understanding, yeah, like, like what it is to have a sense of control over one's experiences and one's visibility and you know for me it wasn't apparent to me like how my illness existed outside of the medical system and I really wanted there to be some way of holding space that was from my own terms um so then the journal kind of 
became this open source tool as well um, where people can like download a PDF and also do it on their own. And, you know, that was very important to me because I was showing this around to different folks and a lot of people were interested in trying it out for themselves. And, you know, for me, like, that was like the first time I built a tool and a framework. Um, and yeah, like it's very much something that I want to continue to think through. Like, what does it mean to create a tool and like something that people can also um, use and participate in? Um, but yeah, this piece was kind of a deeper exploration into the embodiment of my illness. Um, yeah, like I started realizing that there was a lot of fear that I had in terms of, yeah, just like how my body moves and how I live my body and um, a lot of like embodied shame and stigma. And I was working through this process of listening to the sounds of my body. Um, I would put these microphones on my body, just like simple, the ones pictured here are just like simple contact microphones you can get on Amazon for like 10 bucks. Um, and they're microphones that record resonant bodies. So you can put it on a guitar, you can put it on a ukulele, or you can put it on your body. And depending on, yeah, like what you're putting it on, you might be able to hear internal sounds. Um, so I started doing this with my musician friend and recording the different sounds that my body made. And, you know, I have Marfan's, which is a connective tissue disorder. So a lot of what I experience is uh, this, this constant shifting of bones and muscles and joints. Um, I think it's like linked to like hypermobility. Um, but yeah, so my body makes weird sounds all the time. So basically I started recording these sounds and it slowly became more and more apparent that these sounds could become a sense of music and a sense of, um, yeah, like it could become music. So we, so we started remixing it, we started sampling it, we started, you know, playing around in Ableton and slowly it emerged that this became a material that could become music and could be something that could be even danced to. So I started experimenting more with live techniques. And so we figured out a way to kind of do the whole process in real time. So we put the microphones on my body and I would move. And like, as I would move, my body would produce sounds and then the sounds would generate um, into my collaborator, Despina's uh, musical equipment and they would capture it and generate new sounds from it and create this generative soundscape, um, which then I would then move to. So it became this kind of like feedback loop of a performance that was very experimental and very much something that emerged from just this constant playing of my body and rethinking my body as material and rethinking my body as instrument. Um, and also being very heavily inspired by cyborg ways of being. Um, and yeah, that was, that was in 2019 and then the pandemic hit. So we're still kind of like developing this project and we did a performance for it um, in December, 2019. And hopefully we will do them again soon when, you know, it's safe to do so. Well, um, both of our next two artists will also um, hopefully talk more about uh, what it is to be a cyborg. Um, this is something that I think is uh, a really interesting concept.
So maybe let's start with um, this first work called Keep This Leaflet, You May Need to Read It Again, in which you hacked um, an x-ray light box. I found the following statement and um, I highly encourage you all to go on Aminda's website and read about her work and how she describes it because uh, some, something about the way that you write about your work is, is really amazing. Um, so here we go. The exposure of the internal body conceals the identity of the individuals. The spectators are not granted a story that is usually unapologetically demanded of those with visible disabilities. Instead, the diagnostic gaze is fractured and disguised by imagery and sounds that aim to confuse and dismember rather than explain. So the disabled body, in fact, becomes a critical aesthetic medium rather than an object. Similarly, you use materials from your personal medical archive in the more recent Kaleido skeleton series. Uh, I find this idea of subverting the scrutiny of disability and deconstructing imbalances of power incredibly important for disabled artists as a whole. But would you mind telling me more about some of your experiences with objectification and voyeurism as a, disa a visibly disabled woman in the art world and how this may differ from non-disabled or invisibly disabled artists? For, for myself, I was born with multiple physical disabilities. Um, and from the moment I can remember, I was always viewed as a problem um, rather than um, an active member of society. And a lot of this work centers to reclaim those 30 plus years of doctor quantified medical analysis. Um, you get those Fitbits and um, self-quantified uh, apps now that help help describe um, your daily functioning. But for someone that has these tests done unconsentingly, especially as a young person, um, a lot of this work centers to hack that um, and reclaim the identity that's usually hidden and the biology or what is viewed as wrong with the body is highlighted. So a lot of the work that I'm doing with the kaleidoskeleton pieces were to highlight the fact that disabled people are, we're integral to design and creative processes, but we're regularly viewed as inspiration rather than active, the active participants of creating work or being part of creating devices. Um, so a lot of this work I wanted to pull out the beauty that hides within these spaces, within these really cold, sterile spaces that disabled people are subjected to daily. And that doesn't just happen in medical spaces. It's an issue uh, within society for visually disabled people. Um, as once you step out your front door, there's a social choreography of stairs um, and you have to navigate these stairs um, throughout throughout the social space into the medical space and all this all the while you are you are asked to disclose trauma trauma experiences of trauma that others don't realize or view as being something for their curiosity rather than rather than what it is. Yeah, um, which leads on to my next question, which is that you describe this project as a site of digital creative resistance. And I wanted to know how the idea of resistance feeds into your art forms and how technology enables you to do that. Resistance um, is a very common theme throughout my artwork, but also my daily life. Um, and I think that it bleeds into the works that I do. Um, a lot of the time, disabled people who also um, battle other oppressions such as poverty, we are constantly surviving um, instead of instead of ha 
existing and living the life that we want to live. Um, and my work aims to eradicate that survival in a sense, in, in the fact that within the survival, there are spaces of creative uh, beauty. There are spaces that disabled people create that non-disabled people do not have access to. And we have those spaces because of the resilience and the constant oppression that we are subjected to where we try to find unique ways around it that end up being really creative um, artistic skills. And I wanted to highlight that within the work and amplify and honor not just my own um, skills that I've developed as a disabled person, but through all the disabled friends and uh, people around me that I have, I have been, I've been able to um, gain wisdom from and keep surviving. And I think utilizing the very tools such as medical equipment that is used against the, dis the disabled body a lot of the time. Um, for me, it helps give me back my story, give me back a part of a part of my life that has been subjected to at least 15 years of hospital um, stays and admissions and operations for, for what doctors wanted to fix, for which I feel I would have been fine without that normalization done to the body. And it's using these materials, using the materials that, such as the x-rays, MRIs, um, I aim to pull it apart and subvert the code that's within it. I do a lot of programming at the moment. Um, it's been a skill that I picked up throughout the pandemic. Um, not having access to anything like workshops and materials. Um, and the way I've been doing that is via using uh, doctor reports and the language um, that is used to separate the person from the body. Um, so I collected certain words and I input them into a system and then they use the words to manipulate the imagery, which is where we get um, the kaleidoscopic uh, works, which were um, this specific piece was more, um, was also relating to my Desi heritage um, and the fact that disability is viewed in a religious and mythological sense in the South Asian community. Um, and as a result, um, my external family had severed all ties with my family solely to being born disabled. And a lot of, a lot of this work is reclaiming and reattaching myself to my Desi heritage that I felt had been have been taken away. And also it kind of merges the British and Indian acculturation that happens um, with immigrant Indian parents and being born in Britain and the clash that happens with learning about your body as a woman in an Indian South Asian space where everything is, is masked and hidden to the British space where things are not so much hidden and then to a medical space where even with the South Asian nuances of covering my body, I'm expected to undress in front of a row of five doctors. Um, so a lot of this work pulls in that aspect it's, it's a bit difficult for me at the moment <laughs> um, explaining these works. A lot of these works were created in, in the pandemic and 
throughout the pandemic, I've been shielding. I haven't left my flat since March last year, um, which has had a huge impact on my cognitive state. So what I've been able to do is use those creative skills that I have to pick apart what I'm feeling in a physical sense, in a, in a visual sense, and in an oral sense, because I, I currently can't find the words <laughs> or, um, yeah, the words to put, put together this experience, this trauma that's still going on, that's a global um, event, but also a really personal event. So this work tends to encompass all of that <laughs> and tries to, um, yeah, give name to something that doesn't really have a name. Yeah. Um, I think it's worth saying, um, and I encourage everyone to do so uh, at the end, at the beginning, that uh, with Aminda's work in particular, a lot of it is moving image and sound um, is quite a fundamental element of some of these works too. So stills, although beautiful, don't necessarily do um, works justice so I do encourage you to go, and go in and watch them um, and about this work you have described them as audio visual and vestibular stims um, for those that don't know stimming it uh, refers to the act of self-stimulatory repetitive sensory and bodily behaviors um, when I was doing research and looking into stims um, there's a lot of ableist language around what they are um, and seeing how Aminda described the, these artwork systems was fascinating to me and I think a lot of people are sometimes under the impression that stimming is a very physical thing um, or it relates to sensory objects that you touch uh, but not necessarily that engage the other senses and so I wanted to ask Aminda as a neurodivergent artist, can you tell us about making these audiovisual films and their importance to your process? Which you kind of did, but <laughs> feel free to go in on more detail. Yeah, during the pandemic, a lot of my cognitive symptoms were have been uh, quite heightened and still are today. Um, and I wanted to utilize that instead of most of the time as a neurodivergent person, you end up masking, you end up trying to mimic um, other people's social cues and um, ways of being. Um, and I wanted to eradicate that. I wanted to be okay with my, with my crip words and my crip voice and being able to to utilize that and as, as a neurodivergent person, a big, part of, a big part of that is dealing with sensory overload or sensory um, depri deprivation. And it was actually through creating this work that I realized or that I was embedding the idea of stimming into the work itself because stimming as you said, most people think of it as something you, um, like a tool you can use that can help um, when you're struggling with sensory overloads or you cannot concentrate. What I realized is that for a lot of disabled people, grasping things can be difficult for myself as well. And one way I've got around that was to create sensory experiences on my computer um, and via a mouse or dictation. And with this work in particular, the, the morphine movement, this one, um, is it possible to show a clip of the video? Do you think it might be more? Yeah. Yeah.
yeah, I'm glad we, we showed it because I think, um, at least for me watching, I complimented Yo-Yo's work as therapeutic. And I think these, this, the videos from this project also have a very calming and therapeutic feeling, at least within the viewer. So was that also the experience as the creator? Definitely. I found it was an unconscious tool for catharsis. It was, um, it was a happy accident. <laughs> um, and it was through me trying to experiment with um, different sensory outputs and finding one that soothed um, at this time. And the the audio comes from the visual data from x-rays um, and the white teeth that you can see in the imagery are my internal prostheses that are evident on my x-rays that I've pulled out um, into beautiful patterns instead that kind of also mimic uh, South Asian patterns. And it's just something about the colors and the reverberation of the sound that seems to soothe any vestibular imbalance a person might have. Um, I found that extremely calming and I remember sending it to a neurodivergent friend of mine as well and it was, it was beautiful to know that they also experienced um, a similar uh, catharsism from it. And I think I think a lot of stimming can, can even come from the YouTube videos of water being washed away from the sea and back. Those are quite common um, and they're not viewed as stims, but they can be extremely calming on a mental health basis, but also neurodivergent. Um, watching, watching certain patterns, um, the movement especially, and I found during the pandemic, my, my neurodivergent skills have been the ones that have really, really helped with survival and resistance during this time. Thank you. Well, well, I, I'm looking forward to coming all together, um, but we still have one artist, Anna, with which to ask direct questions. So, so Hannah. Your work uh, differs somewhat to some of the other artists here and your general art practice often uses more traditional materials, but there are specific works that relate to your personal experience of disability uh, and your understanding of cyborg theory. Uh, this includes moving image work. Sometimes I feel like my body is a birdhouse, but there are too many holes and I can't tell which one is the entrance. And your zine, I would rather be a cyborg than a god. I'm going to read an excerpt from the zine in which you dissect the source, the cyborg, the cyborg Manifesto, written by Donna Haraway in 1985, which formed the basis for developing theories to emerge. For Haraway, and for other non-disabled people, the cyborg is a metaphor. For sick and disabled people, in contrast, it is a definite and embraced reality. We identify as cyborgs seriously. We embrace this identity with pride. Assistive technologies, robotics, prosthetics, medical devices, these are not simply metaphorical extensions of our beings, but integral parts of our beings. They are what make the world a more accessible place. And so I wanted to ask you whether you identify as a cyborg and what led you to exploring these concepts in your work. Yeah, um, so I'd say I do um, identify as a cyborg. I think it initially was more of something I would kind of say almost as a joke. And I think throughout the years, it has become a lot more serious the more I think about it. Um, I guess what led me to that was my own just uh, experiences with getting um, medical devices um, and how that kind of, I think, mentally the process of like accepting that I needed them. 
because I, I guess to begin, like um, I was diagnosed with type one diabetes um, while I was living in the UAE where I grew, grew up. Um, and so the, for the first um, around like nine years of having diabetes, I managed it in a, I guess, manual way in the sense that I was just kind of doing multiple injections a day and like pricking my finger to um, get my blood glucose levels. And then I moved to New York for university. And in my second year there, I joined um, what is called the like diabetes online community on Instagram and sort of started to connect with other people who had um, diabetes. And I found out about all these devices that I that have existed for years that I didn't know about because they um, weren't available in the UAE at the time. And particularly, I found out about um, continuous glucose monitors, um, which in these pictures, are, it, it's me inserting it when I eventually got it. Um, but what the monitor is, is kind of a sensor that you insert under your skin every week or so, depending on which one you have. And that kind of sends the data to your phone. And so you're constantly being updated with what your blood glucose level is. Um, and it will also send off an alarm when you're not in the ideal range to sort of alert you to do something to take care of yourself. And that was something that when I found out about this, um, I have always kind of struggled with really severe low blood sugar levels, particularly at night, which meant that many times I would miss out on sleep for days because I was really anxious about not knowing that my blood sugar would drop and that can be quite life threatening really quickly. And so when I found out about these devices, I wanted to get them, um, but there was this like internalized idea of um, relying on technology being sort of a negative thing where you were just not really trying hard enough to um, function without them. And it wasn't until I was actually taking a class on cultural studies and we had to read uh, the cyborg manifesto and have like a seminar on it. And so it was kind of like a strange moment of reading this text and learning about this way of understanding the body in a much more expansive sense. Um, while I had been thinking about getting this device and so in, in a way um my interest in the idea of the cyborg is kind of what led me to becoming one or kind of getting these devices and and so eventually I did go ahead to to try to do the whole insurance process to get it and I quickly realized uh that it was just making my daily life so much easier that whenever I would go through periods of time when I wasn't able to have it, it did directly feel like something was missing almost because I was able to exist without this device, but not in a way that I felt comfortable because all of a sudden things became a lot more difficult again. And um, there was a lot more energy that I had to spend to just try to kind of make it through each day. And so I kind of, I guess from then on started to realize that a lot of these conversations that were being had about cyber theory or about the body in my classes that I was going to um, were never really taking into account uh, experiences of illness or disability. You know, there were all these conversations about technology and our reliance on it and our relationships with the environment and everything, but never was kind of disability or illness mentioned in those spaces. And that's kind of what made me want to explore that more and look for other people who are also exploring these ideas because they knew they kind of had to be there somewhere. Um, and yes, I think that's kind of just what led me to exploring that theory. And um, in your zine, uh, you highlight how a black market for life-saving insulin thrives on social media. Thousands are forced to rely on an illegal network of benevolent strangers to ensure they can access the life-saving drug. I wanted to think about assistive technology here in the many forms it takes 
um, but bring in social media, which is a global technology that most people access um, or use potentially unlike other forms of assistive technology. But for disabled people more than others, it can literally save lives and act as a database for people who might alternatively be extremely isolated so socially and medically. Um, so I was wondering if you could tell us more about how the diabetic community in particular have utilized technology to create community and find solutions for the issues they face medically. Yes, yeah, so um, in terms of the insulin black market, um, that was something that I, again, found out about when I was living in New York. I guess primarily because insulin is very inaccessible there. It's, it's more expensive than anywhere else in the world. Um, so what would cost me like 40 euros over here in Spain costs um, above of like $300 in the US. And so obviously many people are unable to access that, which is within three days, you will die without it. And so um, using social media, people have been able to um, kind of use code words a lot of the time to avoid getting caught because it is illegal to share medication, but um, to kind of find ways to figure out who is um, kind of running out of insulin or trying to save up by using less than they actually need um, and to you know figure out who lives nearby and can ship them that insulin. Um, so that's kind of one way that it is used mostly through Twitter, but there are like Facebook groups that use these code words as well to kind of build this network of, of um, mutual aid uh, in a way. Um, and then also there's other ways that it's helped me personally as well being on social media. I mean, first of all, without that, I wouldn't have like found out about, about a lot of the technologies that I'm using now um, that have made my life a lot easier. But then also things were like, um, in I'm sure all of your experiences as well, a lot of the time doctors just don't really have any idea what the daily experience of living with a certain condition is like. And so speaking to other people online um, when you don't really have them around you in, in real life, um, who are going through these similar experiences to me has been really helpful because I've spoken to people who have given me advice for how to care for myself um, that I had no, like I didn't know about before and has just kind of made that daily experience so much easier. And yeah, just I guess building those communities of, of people that have these experiences and can sort of help support you in different ways is, is kind of part of this whole diabetes online community that I mentioned before. I can't remember whether it was in the zine or uh, as part of like resources to go with, but uh, there was also a really cool um, group that I guess had emerged from connecting digitally, looking to create like an open source uh, recipe for yeah. creating your own insulin uh, mm -hmm. at home, which I thought is um, unfortunately where the future is headed if, if they continue to price insulin at such unaffordable uh, and unethical rates. Yeah, so there's a group called Open Insulin that is working to um, kind of reverse engineer insulin to figure out how to produce it. And so then the plan is to um, kind of send out that formula um, so that people can kind of start producing it in small scales. And so it's more affordable because I, the problem with insulin production is that there's only three companies that produce it. And so if there aren't price caps, they can price it at whatever amount that they want because they know people will do what they can to get it because it's the only medication that you can survive off of um, and so it's the open insulin is kind of finding ways of making that a lot more accessible to people and yeah I think there was also um, what I had mentioned was uh, something called open APS which is uh, different to that but 
it's also a group of diabetics that had, um, they had insulin pumps and the sensors um, and they sort of came up with this idea of hacking insulin pumps by building a program to get the glucose sensor to communicate with the pump. So it would function almost as an automatic pancreas. And so they ended up figuring out how to build this program um, with a, another separate device called a Riley link. And they have all the information for this program uh, freely available as well so that people can basically yeah, hack their pumps and get it to work almost automatically, which takes away a lot of the maths that you have to do daily for managing diabetes. Um, and now there are um, companies that have found out about this idea and started to produce it, but it's still readily available for the people that can't um, access these newer technologies. Great, well, I've asked all of my questions. We could go on forever, I would hope, but uh, I know Yo-Yo's looking at a different sort of time, <laughs> time of the day than we are over here. Um, but yeah, I want to open the floor up on, on Zoom. One should be able to raise their hand by clicking on the reactions tab at the bottom. Um, my questions are very loose. Um, I really wanted to know from Joe and from Aminda as well, kind of how you learned um, to use technology and to have ownership over technology because that's something that I think is um, a really admirable thing to do because I think technology kind of like owns me, like controls me. I have to um, figure out how to use it rather than being the master of it, which some people seem to be able to do much better than others. Um, and I'm sure there's a similar feel to coding and that kind of having, um, understanding the language, you know, which some people won't have any understanding of at all. Um, and maybe just to highlight essentially some of the inequalities that come with technology, um, being able to learn it, use it, own it, study it. Um, and then COVID as well in terms of what galleries and museums, their relationship with technology, whether you think that the pandemic has changed the way they view it and whether that will have a positive impact on the future or whether uh, accessibility is never really, um, that kind of digital accessibility is only so tangible now because of the pandemic and maybe won't be as soon as life goes back to the old normal or whatever they want to call it. Um, so feel free to raise your hands or um, to ask each other questions because that would also be perfectly welcome. Um, do you want to talk to them maybe? Um, I also, you more than others maybe, um, the way you write about your work is often a, like cripping the cyborg um, and I wondered whether you would like to expand on what Hannah talked about with cyborg theory and the way that you have embraced it. For myself, um, cyborg theory is, I think it's used, it's used by crips much differently than it is um, non-disabled people and um, especially Donna Haraway, who uses it as more as a metaphor. Um, Whereas I believe that there's a scholar and poet who's been speaking about this with Alice Wong on um, disability visibility, um, about how disabled people are the real cyborgs. Um, we depend a lot of the time on technology day to day. Um, and, and she came up with this really funny word of, uh, I believe it was triborgs. Uh, non-disabled people <laughs> um, talking about cyborgs, um, which I find really, I find that really helpful. Um, not the triborg thing. I mean, <laughs> the the cyborg and the cripborg, um, because for myself, it has been a process to try and regain control, I guess, um, 
especially if you think of also mobility aids, they are technology in a sense. They, they help to, such as my, my power chair and my crutches, they help me um, feel free, they help me walk, they help me um, feel a part of this world. Um, and there's so much more that we can do with these extra technologies we have. We, we open new spaces for creativity with these technologies. Um, I've used crutches as extra limbs before to create artworks with, or um, yeah, just there's, there's so much creativity in, in um, having these extra technologies and the spaces between um, non-disabled and kind of crit orgs. Um, this, there is so much uh, room for manipulation and that's what I've been trying to do with the works that I create is um, manipulate the technologies that I have but also link them to the public sphere because a lot of people think disabled lived experience is so opposite than their own lives and they and it's not there are aspects that are very different, but pain is a shared phenomenon. And using these types of technologies and making people more comfortable with these technologies and seeing these technologies more often um, has been my way of trying to connect the public sphere to the disabled life, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I um, also wanted to say in terms of I think the divide, um, especially within the disability community of those who can afford um, and have their lives benefited from assistive devices and technologies and those that perhaps can't. Um, and in your work, Aminda, you do quite a lot of hacking. Um, so would you mind telling us a bit about that, how you came to discover it and pursue it? Um, it was more through my own body. Um, I've had 16 major operations and about 40% of my body is fused with titanium. And a lot of that, I, I knew at a younger age, I'm now aware that some of that wasn't really required. It was more a, the doctors wanted me to pass as able-bodied um, and my body was modified for that reason where I didn't really have control. I didn't know what I was saying yes to uh, with these operations. Um, and I wanted to use the idea of hacking um, as not as passing, not as fixing or elimin eliminating a problem and not about retrofitting to the, uh, the non-disabled world, but more as more as a way of disrupting hacking hierarchies um, and who has the privilege of saying whose body needs to be changed. Um, and it was, through, it was through that that I started thinking about the way that disabled bodies are normalized to be more pleasing to the eye for non-disabled people, such as like the, the um, image we had up, I believe Hannah's, uh, from the disability is disturbing. Mm -hmm. um, and I start, yes, yeah, so I started thinking about that focus on the normalization of bodies. And also myself, I've never had opportunities to access STEM, um, STEM education. And whenever I've spoken to professionals, they automatically don't see me as a professional because I'm disabled. And that really, um, yeah, well, it really pissed me off. <laughs> but at the same time, um, I wanted to do something to combat that. Um, and the way I, I felt I could was, I, I've been very creative from a young age and I like taking things apart, putting them back together. Um, and I wanted to try that with various 
technologies that I had around me. So I had a broken blood pressure cuff um, and there was some really, actually I've got a pile of crutches in the corner, <laughs> a corner as well that I've been trying to make something out of. And I had, I had these materials um, and I started thinking about ways to emphasize the beauty of crit bodies as being not only subversive, but a different type of beautiful. And I wanted to, yeah, just make these um, technologies more evident. Um, and so I started looking into coding myself. I started, um, I, when I was younger um, during operation, I was really bored. So I taught myself HTML web, web design. Um, and then I remembered that I really liked the language, um, not the language itself, but learning a new language. Um, and then I started looking into coding as a way of hacking the body, hacking my own body, but hacking um, non, the non-disabled world as well, because it's a world that's ultimately been made without disability in mind. Um, and yeah, so it's through self-teaching that I've come to where I am now. Um, and then I've met a few friends along the way through um, kind of online classes with STEM um, who have been teaching me a bit more about, um, currently I'm learning a bit more machine learning um, and how to, how to create and perpetuate positive images of disability online um, and algorithms that surround that. Um, but yeah, it all came from the experience of having my own body hacked without, even though I've signed consent, you sign consents every time you have an operation, I didn't really know what I was signing. Um, I was very young and mm -hmm. I wanted to reclaim that. Uh, yeah, yeah. I um. She told me that she goes to sleep around one thirty, <laughs> so it's probably twelve thirty at this stage. Um, I, I do want to ask uh, Joe about how he came to learn um, technology, and he's been nodding his head a lot. But is there anything you wanted to add about your own experience um, becoming an artist that very much uses technology in their practice? Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to stay. This is like the most riveting conversation I've had in like. Oh, well, I wanted to ask ever. I don't know. <laughs> like, <laughs> so, yeah, I'm I'm here for it. I'm here for it. Great. Um, um, tell us yeah. about um, Taiwan, Taipei, uh, where I believe you're currently staying, because um, Noni, who's part of the Brothers Sick, works with me on Ablezine and he told me uh, when you guys were working on that project that that life in Taiwan is basically um, normal because of how well um, they've managed to suppress the virus and uh, yeah I wanted to tell us how it is there and kind of what you may be taking away from this experience. Yeah it was really interesting because I was in Taiwan this time last year and like a little bit earlier for Chinese New Year. And there was like, you know, notice that something was happening in China. And so Taiwan immediately started kind of uh, controlling the number of flights coming in from China and they started rationing masks and making sure everyone had one. and. Um, there's like kind of all these like policies that went into place even before anything left China. And I remember feeling like, oh yeah, like there's just like this like flu or something that's happening and, you know, nothing happened in Taiwan. So I was like, oh, this is like, just like a China thing. And then I remember going back to New York and then there was like the first case emerged in like upstate New York. And then I was like, oh, interesting. It like came all the way over here. And then I was like, oh yeah, no, it's gonna be okay. It's probably like one of those things that's like the bird flu or something, you know? 
and then like I was like yeah maybe people will take care of it like the government I don't know and then it like wasn't taken care of <laughs> and then just like kept spreading and no one was talking about it and I was just like what like having this moment of like watching like a slow train wreck like happen right before my eyes and I was just like having a lot of anxiety and, and as a result of seeing just like how it was handled and then how it just wasn't handled um so being back here what has been a trip it's been interesting because people you know have a very deep trust of the government in Taiwan, which I can't say is necessarily possible in the US or in different countries. Um, you know, without accountability, you know, so I think in Taiwan, there's like this relationship with the government where you consent to giving your data to the government, and the government will know where you are when you get off the plane, right? So they like give you like a SIM card, they'll follow where you are at for 14 days, and then that's it. And like, they'll send you like care packages with snacks and like text messages being like, how are you feeling today? Just text back the number one if you're feeling okay. Um, so there's just like this like sense of care that they have about like how you're doing. Um, and we have this technology commissioner named Audrey Tang, who's like this super badass trans woman and has been implementing civic technology throughout Taiwan. So kind of like figuring out ways in which, you know, people are already using their mobile phones and using apps and using all these different ways of engaging with each other and harnessing that power and allowing the public to also be able to contribute to government policy making so there's like this app that the public can download and they can like vote on different kinds of like policies that are coming into play like should we have uber drivers in this part of the town and like they operate on this level of progress in the sense of uh they have this like idea where when there is consensus, they can move forward on a policy, which I think is really interesting because what ends up happening a lot where policy gets bogged down or things just like kind of just like get stagnant, I think with lawmaking is that there's like a lot of voices and like a lot of like, um, yeah, like different ways of engaging with the policy that kind of like uh, causes things to stand at a standstill. So what ends up happening with this app and this data that comes from the app, they implement that data and implement that technology within their legal making decision. So I think that's really interesting because I don't know if, yeah, like how often governments really kind of like interface with the public in this way um and it in a way that kind of like is yeah like using the technology that people have access to um yeah 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 so yeah there's like a lot more there's like layers of what they're kind of implementing that i probably kind of butchered in describing but um, I think that has been like a really interesting model. And I know because of like the political structures of Taiwan being part of China, but also its own independent country, that there's like a lot of contention around where Taiwan exists as a uh, presence within like the UN and stuff like that. So it's also really interesting because a lot of this information Taiwan was like, let's share this with the public and let's share this with the world. But a lot of countries are like, oh, China doesn't see you as a real country, so we're not going to let you share this with us. So there's a lot of like, yeah, like 
tension and suppression that happens when it comes to Taiwan. Um, but I think there have been like really lovely articles that have been written about it. And I think there are people that have been, yeah, like trying to like share this information because I think it's always really interesting when, you know, trying to build a more just and equitable world, like with the tools that we have, like what that could look like, you know, and like what that could look like in real time in a real society. Um, so yeah. 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 I think it's um, really interesting. And I, I, I always think like having read about other countries that are handling the virus um, really effectively that countries like the UK and the US have such like a colonizer mentality that the idea of taking information or resources, even though they're so much more heightened and intellectual and even in like your instance, able to express like care networks and things like that through the technology that we just cannot seem to like work together um, or receive, you know, resources from countries that are not considered of the same like caliber or something in, even though that's a really problematic point to have. But um, yeah, I find it really frustrating because the whole world could have been handling this much more effectively if we worked together. But unfortunately, that's just not the way it, <laughs> the way it goes. Um, but yeah, thank you for telling us about that. Was there anything you wanted to add in terms of like um, your education and your learning of technology um, through your studies or whether it was more of a DIY process like Aminda? Yeah, I think for me, a lot of my approaches to technology have, have had similar desires, I think, in terms of wanting to create something with the tools that I had accessible to me. And um, yeah, I really love this idea that Aminder was talking about in terms of just like hacking and like reclaiming hacking and thinking about the ways in which the different medical interventions have, you know, hacked our bodies um, many times, yeah, just like not with consent. And I think for me, technology has been a way for understanding myself more than I do in the physical world in the sense that, you know, I often have found ways of manipulating my images, like my image of myself, like um, the way that I perform and the way that I often create presence within the digital sphere is often the way that I can also create identities for myself and create ways of engaging with the self um, and yeah through doing video work and through doing these kinds of self manipulations and ways of understanding myself through glitching myself or through um yeah like recording and remixing myself that has been like a really big part of my movement practice. Um, yeah, because I didn't, you know, come into um, dancing until I started making that piece with the microphones. So a lot of what I was exploring was very much within the realm of hacking these um, interfaces and microphones and technologies for my own purposes. Um, yeah, and a lot of it was kind of just like learning on the fly. Um, lots of YouTube videos, lots of tutorials. 
from like the most depths of the internet. Um, and I often think, yeah, there, there is this level of um, wanting to create and yeah, like use technology to develop new worlds, you know, like I think there is this ability to do that within especially a digital sphere and especially within this kind of space. So I often think that in many ways there has been this growth and there has been this um, more real, real life within digital space than what I could have imagined outside of it. Um, so yeah, yeah. No. Okay, Joe. Time to tell us about your uh, history, how you got into working so much with tech in your practice. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess I, I was I was lucky as a as a child. Um, programming to me was always kind of a land of imagination and stories and uh, uh, losing myself uh, in in in, a, in uh, the act of creativity. Um, as, as a child, I was bought um, a series of books of like how to draw dragons, how to draw aliens, how to write computer games. It was all on the same kind of genre. And um, so I'm lucky and I've always had a kind of a, a desire to understand um, how programming works. Um, I think that kind of the open source idea of be, having the code visible kind of really facilitated my journey. Um, just being able to view the source of a web page and start to think of it as a remix culture. I think that would describe the best way I learned programming of view the source of this page. That's kind of cool. Grab a bit of that, grab something else, put it together. Oh, that did something. And just that playfulness. I think, I think unfortunately, then I went and formally studied um, computer science and that crushed the creativity of programming for me. I think it's important to appreciate that programming is a very broad spectrum. And through education, I was taught it as an engineering subject and uh, probably hurt, hurt me for 10, 10 years or so trying to work out again that I wanted to use it as a creative form of self-expression, um, kind of seeing it very much as a, as a way of earning a living, a way of... Um, a way of building real things, building bridges, building building software that's like like architecture, and I think it was really through my disability that I started to question this, and um, it kind of ties into both what Hannah and Aminda have have said. Um, in fact, what everyone has said really is, uh, I started to have a. I hadn't ever thought of it as a cyborg, but with with my wheelchair, um, I. Um, I'm very much dependent on it. I think about it as part of my body and I started to, it started to break and it was my first wheelchair and I had a had to have a company to come and fix it for me and it took them like three months to fix the wheelchair and I was kind of having these discussions with them as like, well, can I do this? They were, no, no, you're not, you're not allowed to fix your wheelchair and it's that kind of question of like, but this is my body. <laughs> this, this is like, this is fundamental to my movement through through space. This is like, it was the strongest feeling of that body. And um, it made me realize thinking about programming that I was using it the way I was being told to. And I wasn't questioning that relationship about what I wanted to do with it, what I wanted to do and what I wanted, how I wanted to control it. And it was that same thing with the wheelchair. It was like, okay, with the wheelchair, I was like, well, I'm just going to learn how to do this because I want to take ownership of this and this is part of my body. I almost think of, of coding as, as part of my body as well, um, in that it's that same sense of taking control. And um, when I've done performance work where I project uh, the code and I live kind of edit it and write it to an audience where I'm creating music and visuals, I'm on the stage um, and it makes me wonder, I want to learn more about the Cyborg Manifesto, that I'm kind of projecting my mind onto a wall and people are watching me think. And that is a very interesting relationship. So I'm very self-conscious on the stage. I'm very aware of sitting in a wheelchair. I'm not massively um, confident or comfortable with that. But there's this interesting 
feeling of people looking at my mind work because programming is um, removing the engineering. Programming is a way of thinking. It's a way of constructing thought. You don't actually need a computer to program. It's a, a thought process. And people having kind of a portal into your mind and seeing the creative and the kind of building things processed through code um, to me is, 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 is kind of very important to my, my, my experience of disability and the idea that I think has connected a lot of themes to that control of visibility, that, that idea that code is a way of thinking and I can share that with people uh, as a performance. Um, yeah, it, it, it's a long journey to get there, but I, th I think the most important thing is that programming is a very broad spectrum and it's that seeking it for self-expression as in it's like any tool that's difficult to pick up um, it's it's the idea that you start with what you want and then the programming is the thing that fills in that space and you're not learning programming for the sake of programming you're learning it because there's a thing you want to say um the the anecdote about your wheelchair um is something that i can imagine it experiencing myself but in a way i have um, mainly because I haven't been able to access um, as easily as easily as I would like an electric wheelchair um, or a mobility scooter and these devices are so expensive um, but the mechanism is so similar across other forms of movement related technology and it really winds me up that there's a detachment um, with these types of like automotive equipments and the disability community that we're somehow not deserving of it, uh, that we don't use it in the same way that say an athlete might. Um, and that it's something that should be um, like not, that we're just not allowed to have, you know, and if you are allowed to have it, then it becomes something that's very empowering and gives you much more freedom and flexibility. Obviously there's barriers then with architectural inaccessibility and things like that. But it's just always annoyed me so much that uh, what could easily be transferred into a mobility device and made more economical, you know, faster, less heavy, less clunky, you know, it's all, all the adjectives. Um, that we're not there yet. Um, and that's, I guess, part of my mission with Ablezine that, that one day we can make these things far more accessible uh, than they currently are. Um, so maybe Hannah, we can end with you talking a bit about your glucose monitor or you know how, what you would like to envision for the, the future of the disability community, whatever you think um, would be relevant. Yeah, I think um, interesting that idea of also like not being able to kind of do what you want with these devices and having to use them as, as you're told because I um, I also have like an insulin pump um, that I started to use recently and it's interesting because I the way that it's kind of set up to work automatically I know doesn't work for me and so I've had to kind of adjust certain things and then I'm sort of told that I'm not supposed to do that and I'm supposed to let it kind of do what it does automatically. And so you end up kind of having this frustration um, with when you have to kind of go to doctor's appointments and explain what you're doing with it because you're not supposed to do it that way even if it works for you. Um, so that's, yeah, that's interesting to see how that kind of cuts across different kinds of devices as well. Um, and then also I, I just was thinking back to the idea of the triborg that Amanda brought up. Because um, it's kind of like a thing that is, especially recently become an issue with um, diabetes technology, specifically the sensors, because um, the, these sensors are again, very inaccessible. They're difficult to get a lot of the time. There's stock issues. And so you have to wait until they're available to be shipped to you. Um, but now these companies have started to sell them to people who don't have diabetes or any kind of um, health condition. Um, you know, so it's these people that are buying these devices 
despite the fact that people with diabetes are like fighting with insurance companies to be able to get them. Um, so people are, are buying these devices, being gifted these de devices sometimes just to kind of experiment and try to optimize their bodies. And it's frustrating because there's articles popping up of these people sharing their experience with the devices and um, speaking about how, yeah, basically how to optimize their bodies. And so it kind of becomes a very ableist way of using an assistive technology um, and you know like sharing how people how they think it looks ridiculous or things like that while we're using it not not because we necessarily want to but because it kind of makes our daily life a little less difficult and so yeah that's kind of I guess that difference between the cyborg and the triborg is like people that are using it as an experiment and others who are using it because they need to I'm so grateful. I feel like I've learned a lot about you all um, in this call. And I hope that some of you remain contacts and friends um, and follow each other on Instagram, etc. Um, and peruse each other's websites to see uh, what more I did not share. <laughs> it's really lovely to meet everyone. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, thank you. I, I feel like I've got to go away and just let what everybody said just sink in over the next week or two. So much to think about. Thanks. No. Uh, maybe yeah. one day we can come together again in, in real life, but uh, we would have to be able to afford a, a flight ticket for yo yo. Um, <laughs> but uh, thank you all so much. And I really hope you have a wonderful weekend. and a good few months as good as they can be thank you likewise thank you so much, thank you so much. have a good night bye, bye.